second half of the NFL season is here, and those young QBs are putting on a show. But who's the best team? This is when we separate the pretenders from the contenders. And you can follow that story every Sunday with the NFL on CBS. Welcome back to Fourth and Forever. We got a very special guest, a Super Bowl champion, former teammate, Orange County native. And then he moved up to Northern California, AKA Southern Oregon, Zach Ertz from the Philadelphia Eagles. How we doing, buddy? What's up, brother? How you doing? I'm good. One, it's awesome to have you on the show. Please give Julie a big hug for us because uh, I know she's your better half. And uh, we, love, we love Julie Ertz on this show. But I want to get some of your reactions to some games this weekend. You watched a little bit of the Vikings Packers, you said, and I thought, you know, I predicted early in the week, now that I'm on TV, I have to have all these great answers during the week that I never end up being correct. But I predicted the pack <laughs> to just roll all over these guys and a guy named Dalvin Cook showed up. But you said you watched some of that game. What do you think of it? Yeah, I mean, like you said, Dalvin Cook showed up and the dude's a beast. I mean, he, it's kind of been his M.O., that team's M.O. When they get him rolling, they got a chance to be a really good football team. And we saw it this weekend against the Packers. He had like four touchdowns or whatever it was. Just went out there and balled in Lambeau. Um, so very impressive win by the Vikings. Obviously, no one was really picking them. But, you know, when you're a casual fan, you don't put too much. I was just kind of flipping through the games, just kind of watching. Uh, not very biased. Um, so it's fun to be in the NFL and kind of just watch games to watch games. I know you're rehabbing right now. You get to focus on that. But how does it work like when you watch your team? One, did you go to the game? Did you Were you in the stadium for when you guys played the Cowboys? Yeah, so with the COVID protocols, it's crazy. It's like no injured guys, no extra people on the sidelines. Right. No one else is allowed to be on the sidelines. So you got to sit up in the suite. So I did not go to the game, um, but I'm watching tentatively or attentively at home. And it's tough watching, man. It's tough not being able to play. It's tough not being able to make a difference. Um, Cause you're so invested in the guys. Uh, you wanna see all the guys do extremely well. And when you have zero control over the outcome, it's tough, it's tough to sit there. It's, it's just brings out this itch. Like your body knows you're supposed to be, be playing, your mind knows, yeah. your heart knows, but you're not able to go physically, so it's tough. Do they at least give you a call sheet or anything? Can you be like on the phone with Dom DeSandro, like getting the plays, what's going on? <laughs> I actually caught a couple of them. All the touchdowns were my play calls. No, uh, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, I know Good like answer. the game plan. I sit in the meetings, so I know the game plan going into the game. I, I, I still like being involved, kind of helping the guys out, helping some of the um, other tight ends out, some of the receivers, what I see going into the week, or watch some of the practice film and help some of the guys. Um, so I try to stay sharp mentally, but it is tough not being able to be there and hear the play calls. You just kind of see the formations, the motions, and then you're like, okay, here's this play coming, but it's still not the same. With you guys, um, one of the things I notice is how deep your tight end room is. People say that like on paper going into a season, but you guys have literally had to use every tight end you've had. Yeah. Right now, you know, with you and Goddard out, Rodgers has picked up the slack. How would you assess his play? And, you know, what are you talking to him about during the week as he gets ready to start, you know, for the first time and stuff? This has got to be all new territory for him. Yeah, so Rich, um, he's a heck of a player, man. He's been in the league for a long time. I think this is year six or seven for him now. He started for four years in Green Bay before he came to Philly. Um, and Dallas came back last week. So uh, when Rich was playing, my message to him was just, dude, you've, you've done this for so long. We're not asking you to do anything that you haven't done in your past. Don't put too much pressure on yourself and just go out there and ball. And against the Giants on Thursday night football, he goes out there six for 85 yards, uh, has a huge 30 yarder, I think in a two minute drill late in the fourth quarter. So I'm yeah. not surprised with how these guys play when they go in. They're extremely well prepared. Our tight end coach, Justin Peel, who you know, obviously, he's been my yeah. tight end coach since, since I got in the league. He prepares us extremely diligently. So I'm not surprised that any of these guys come in there and have success. Yeah, we love Peeler, too, even though he's an Oregon duck, whatever. Um, <laughs> across the league, it's been, you know, there's been a ton of injuries, especially at the tight end position. It's Kittle, it's you, like big name guys, Hooper. I mean, is this just a random occurrence? What's the what's your take on all that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just tough. I mean, I had a contact injury on my ankle, um, rolled it out a couple of weeks. Kittle, um, unfortunately, with the foot, um, it's just part of the business. You know, you play in this league long enough, they say the injury rate in the NFL is 100%. Uh, 
Um, everyone's dealing with something each and every week. It's just the matter of severity. And it's just been a year for me where I've had to miss a couple games. And this is the first time that it's been like this. Uh, God willing, it will be the last time, obviously. But I don't put too much stock in the lack of the offseason stuff because I feel like you kind of see this every year. Um, yeah. But it is um, just one of those things that I'm dealing with right now. And obviously, George is dealing with in San Francisco. Austin's... Um, I think Hoop had the appendectomy, so I wouldn't put that on uh, yeah, right, anything right. <laughs> um, in particular. But I, I guess it's just one of those things right now. Yeah, I, I think you made a great assessment that for the casual fan, what you don't realize is the NFL, it's a 100% injury rate. So I, I love that you've accepted that and you understand that we're all hurt. It just is a matter of how bad and if that hurt turns into like an injury, like you said. So I think that's yeah. that's great insight by you. I, I think more people should should understand that. We were talking before we started about Daniel Jones. And what about his big run against you guys <laughs> where he tripped? Uh, they asked me about it on TV, on ESPN, on Get Up. And they're like, hey, as, as somebody who's had an embarrassing moment in New York, what do you think? And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and... And then I was, uh, I said, you know, listen, I can't criticize a guy who made it past his O lineman, man. He made it like 80 yards down the field. So that's good in my book. And uh, so they Dude, all started laughing. Thing. But what did you think when you first saw it? You had to laugh a little. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone found some comedy. We've all been there, honestly. We've right, all right. found, felt something where you feel not as athletic as you really should feel. But, you know, everyone was making such kind of a mockery of it and was like, oh, look at Daniel. But the dude was rolling. Like, people dude, wanted the dude ran so for eight, The dude ran for 80 yards. Like, <laughs> let's not just forget the f right. first 80 yards of that play and let's all focus on the negative ending of it. Like, yeah. the dude made a heck of a play, showed his athleticism, ran by some guys. I feel like that's kind of our society right now. People want to just look at the negative of that play but what about the first 80 yards where the dude's hauling i, th I think he hit like 21 miles an hour or something ridiculous yeah. and that's, let's kind of pump that up in society <laughs> that's great perspective we're going to get back to your positive outlook on football on daniel jones and on life when we talk about your charities but first i want to talk about your marriage to julie ertz where did you guys first meet and what what was your first like pickup line cuz I know being your teammate you're you know cheesy as all get out you got no game <laughs> so what did you say to Julie who's you know a superior athlete what did you say like did you challenge her to a, some sort of sporting match like what was your <laughs> What was the go-to? And I'm going to confirm this with her, so don't lie to me. We're both in college. I was at Stanford. She went to Santa Clara. It's like 20 minutes yeah. away from one another. My buddy Mark Appel was the ace at Stanford baseball player. Um, he goes on to be the number one pick. But he's pitching on Friday night at Stanford. And we have football workouts, so a bunch of us are like, hey, let's go watch the baseball game. So I walk into the stadium. You know, we're, we're like one or two innings late, of course. Got to be fashionably late. And I go into the stadium, and in the student section, there's this blonde girl. And, like, I've never seen her before. Stanford's a small school. I've never seen this girl. So I go up and sit right next to her. I'm like, we're, she's in the student section. So I go up and sit right next to her. We kind of sh share some sunflower seeds. I brought a little bag of sunflower seeds. Asked her if she wanted oh. some. And, oh. and, then we started, and, and then we started talking from there, you know? Thanks to oh, sunflower seeds. On. I just had it going that day. You know when you're in the zone. <laughs> you, <laughs> Uh, but overall, that's how we met. Um, I didn't know she played soccer. She didn't know I played football. I think I was 21. She was 20 at the time. So we've been doing this thing together for a long time. Uh, we met before um, everything yeah. kind of, the, the, I would say, uh, before the spotlight's kind of been on us. Um, sure. So I think our relationship was built outside of sports and athletics, which has been, which has really allowed this to be successful is because we know each other for yeah. who we are, not because of any sport or platform we've been given. Her World Cup win, emotions that you felt for that, and then in return, you guys win the Super Bowl. Was there like a competitive thing going on? Like after she wins her championship, like, damn, you know, <laughs> I got to I gotta do this too? Or was she like pushing you? Did she show you her World Cup ring? Just kind of flaunted out there, like making sure you're still motivated or what's the deal? How did that work? We're definitely a competitive household and it's definitely not lost on me that my wife has two World Cup medals and I have <laughs> one Super Bowl ring. <laughs> but she will tell you this herself, no matter how many Super Bowls I win, it could be five, 
I've won zero World Cups. I've won zero <laughs> World Super Bowl trophies. <laughs> the football, American football is played in one country at a high level. The soccer that. is played in many countries. <laughs> so she's, she's got the bragging rights. She's like, you won a world championship. What world did you play? Um, <laughs> So I'm a little salty about it, honestly. Damn Um, it, Julia. That's a great point. (laughs) But uh, no, it was fun. Obviously, I was in Canada in 2015. 2019, it was in France, and I was able to be there the entire time for the full month. Uh, I went to France, and it was a great experience for me, really the first time living outside of the United States for an extended period of time. And Julie was doing her thing. You know, she couldn't be sidetracked. She only had a limited amount of time to see me throughout the day, throughout the week. She was always playing to one city, go to the next city, whereas we were stationed kind of in Paris. And then we would go to the city that they were playing in the day of the game or the day before. It was definitely a unique experience. When they got to the semifinals in Lyon, they played England. When they won that game, I kind of felt pretty confident that they were going to win the whole thing. But I told her, I said, hey, I've been here for a month now. You might as well win this whole thing now that we're in the final, (laughs) you know? You know That's what I'm good. saying? Um, That's great. But I, overall, yeah, I, I think when I, I speak for both of us on this, that we're both each other's biggest fan. We see the hard work that each other put in on a daily basis, how much we sacrifice, not only for our sport, but away from each other as well. So uh, we understand this is a short season of our life. We don't know how much longer we're both going to play. Um, so we're really just focused on being the best we can be and understand that we'll have years down the line to kind of be a quote-unquote normal married couple so i know like nfl players they get the super bowl ring and then a lot of them get the wives and the girlfriends like the necklace with the little pendant thing on it one did you do that for julie and two did you get to like see the world cup do you get like a patch or like a button that says like (laughs) world cup family supporter or something so they don't do a lot of for julie's world cup trophies it's not some cool ring it's like a gold medal which is cool don't get me wrong so do you get a little one a mini one i get a pat on the back for being a great supporting (laughs) supportive husband come on did you get her the the Uh, necklace i got her the like miniature ring like you have so many options and i knew like i don't even wear my super bowl ring enough um and so i knew she wasn't going to be wearing this thing all the time either but i did get her the miniature kind of replica version of it and she got you nothing in return i just want to note that okay moving on yes Um, yes thank thank you for (laughs) yes i'm glad that's out there for everyone to hear talk about uh your relationship because i have a I said this last year on TV that when Andrew Luck retired, obviously you played with him at Stanford, and I think you guys are, you know, have remained good friends. But I said last year that Andrew Luck's the kind of guy, like, after a year, he'll either start training again and want to come back and play, or he's going to, like, move to Europe and buy a soccer team. So anywhere in between there, (laughs) what the heck's he doing? What's going on with Andrew? Yeah, Andrew, I mean, I love the guy. Like you said, when he retired, it, it, like, almost brought me tears to my eye. You know, he was a year older than me at Stanford. He was kind of the standard of the program if you wanted to do if you wanted to follow anyone all the coaches would just be like hey follow andrew he does everything right one of the smartest people i've ever seen but he recently had his daughter lucy luck the beautiful little girl Um, so i think right now he's just enjoying being a dad you know i haven't brought up the conversation with him hey what are you thinking do you miss it? Anything like that? Because I know he's just loving where he's at right now, really enjoying it. And whatever he, he does next, is going to be successful. I, he, I don't know exactly yeah. what that's going to be, but he's just too talented and gifted that and passionate about whatever he does, he's going to pour himself into that. And so right now it's being yeah. a great dad, um, but I can't see, I feel like what comes next. You were alluded to him having a baby. You and Julie been married a little while now. We just had quarantine. <laughs> you guys had plenty of time together. Are we expecting a baby announcement soon? That's just, I'm getting a lot of baby announcements in my text messages and emails right now. <laughs> Tells me a lot about what people were doing in quarantine and their cardio regimen. So. Yeah, you know, when the time's right, everything will happen when it needs oh, to happen, God willing. Gosh. Um, right. But currently that is not in the cards. All right. All right. All right. I had to ask. Andrew Luck to Carson Wentz. You guys have a real strong bond. It's obvious. You're 
his guy. Every quarterback has somebody that they can like fall back on, essentially the tight end when you have a good tight end. Like I remember playing there with you and Selleck. Those were always great options for the quarterback, right? Explain your guys' bond. Why are you guys so close? And and what do you love about him so much um, as a player? Yeah, you know, Carson is one of the best quarterbacks in the league, in my opinion, and I'll forever say that. Um, I just see how talented he is each and every day. I see how hard he works. I see how much he loves football. Um, and just no matter what's going on, I know he's going to continue to work and work and work. And I think that's something – that initially when he first came, initially kind of I was able to gravitate towards him because of how hard he works and how, how willing he was to put in extra reps on the side field while the rest of practice was going on, while the defense was practicing. We'd go to the side field. We still do to this day. Just go to the side field and talk about routes, talk about what he sees on certain plays, what he wants me to do against cover one, cover three, quarters, cover two, just so that when we get to the game, we're not thinking, he's not thinking, hey, what is that going to re- do? What is his reaction going to be to this coverage? He already knows. We've already played the game in our heads on the side field before we even get to Sunday. And then obviously for us, it's much bigger than football. Um, we're both kind of rooted in our faith. Um, and it's been something that has allowed us to get extremely close over the years. You know, we've had a lot of really strong believers in in the locker room in Philadelphia. Um, and so for us, it's much bigger than football, our relationship, but the stuff you see on Sundays is stuff that gets executed each and every practice during the week because both of us love to kind of work on our craft during the week, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, um, really just figure out how we can be the best players we can be for Sunday. You know, you see guys with great relationships like that. When you talk about going to the side field, and this is something I remember that you are always willing to do during that time during practice when the defense is going through their stuff running against the offensive scout team to get receivers and targets like running backs and tight ends to get them over to the other side field to run through stuff again for the casual fan watching at home this is not easy like it is pulling teeth sometimes (laughs) like please can you come over here and run a post because i want to throw you this ball on sunday but i just want to rep it one more time you would think it sounds like logical and easy but that's not easy so from my time there i appreciate that and i know i'm sure carson does as well because it puts the quarterback at ease like all right cool i know what his body language looks like i know exactly how he's how this cut's gonna feel whatever and, and the landmark for the throw and all that kind of stuff. So thank you for still doing that. <laughs> thank you from me. Thank you from Carson. I'll never change. Um, <laughs> yeah. One of the hardest working guys I've ever been around. That's that's for totally true. You spent the entirety of your career in Philadelphia, something so rare now to have a guy be with one franchise. What about Coach Peterson, Howie, uh, Jeffrey Lurie? Explain your relationship with those, you know, the three most important people in the, in the building and what you love so much about Philly. First of all, Philly is... I mean, you played here. You know what it's like. Philly's the best city to play for. They're so passionate. When you're winning football games, there is no better city to play in. You know, they just lit each and every Sunday. How the following week is going to go for the people of Philadelphia is going to be based on whether we win (laughs) or lose. If we win, it's going to be a great week. If we lose, um, or even if we don't play well, honestly, sometimes if we don't play well enough, the following week is not going to be great. Um, I think that's why I love playing here. People love the game of football here. People are so passionate and they're, and they're very protective of their own. Um, when they're your guy, when I'm their guy, they're very protective of me. They want to see me do extremely well. They want to see me catch the ball, get open each and every Sunday. Um, and in ter- Doug, Howie, Mr. Larry, um, the, the kind of culture they've instilled in Philadelphia is a culture that I think has been built on hardworking players. You know, you look at some of the guys that have kind of been here for a long time, Lane, um, Fletch, myself, guys that have really been here, Kelsey, um, JP, all these guys go out there and bust their butt each and every practice. And I think so the culture, the priority has been set on guys being willing to go out there each and every week, no matter how terrible you feel on a Wednesday, going out there and practice and busting your butt. And really that sets the tempo for the rest of the team. And you're only going to get better at football by playing football and practicing football and being, and you're only going to be good in the passing game in particular by getting routes um, and kind of putting those, putting that time on task Um, And so I think that's the culture that they've built. Obviously, Howie has done a great job kind of molding the team throughout the years, um, figure out who his guys are going to be and kind of really building the team around there. We've had a lot of success over the years, even since since I got here, we've had a lot of success. 
um, and Mr. Lurie, it all stems from Mr. Lurie and his ability to kind of invest in this organization, invest in the players. You know how our facility is. It's one of the best facilities in the league. And then Doug is just a coach that really, really gets it. You know, he played in the league for a long time. Um, he understands personalities. He understands when to push us. He understands kind of when to pull back. And he's a guy that's really easy to talk to. You know, there are time, there have been spells where it's like, I'm kind of down. Um, and he's the first person to say, hey, my door is always open. And so he'll just be able to have a one-on-one -on -one honest conversation with me. And he's not going to beat around the bush. He's going to tell me how it is. I always tell him, call me out if you see me being stupid or something. And so I love that relationship with Doug. He's one of the best coaches I've ever had and one of the first coaches that I really loved, loved playing for. What about uh, your craziest Eagles fan story? I remember after I got to play on Monday night, going to Geno's and Pat's, that place was just going bananas. But <laughs> your favorite fan interaction moment? I mean, the favorite fan interaction moments in Philadelphia, obviously, were the Super Bowl parade. Um, it was a day like no other days. It was just, you see the joy that the Super Bowl brought the city of Philadelphia. And that whole off season was, you could. You, I feel like the joy level in Philadelphia is typically like a five out of ten. Maybe the Super Bowl. The year we won the Super Bowl was about a ten out of ten. Ten out of ten, maybe eleven out of ten. Yeah. And so you just see the joy that that brought them. Being able to experience the parade with them it was just a blast. And you know, Philadelphia is like such, just such an yeah. Kelsey's outfit. Kelsey's speech. <laughs> Um, you know, he was like laying in bed for days thinking about that speech, just making sure he hit everything. Miles Teller, you know who that is? Yeah. You know his football hey, fantasy fan. name? What is it? My Ball Zacherts. <laughs> oh, that's good, man. That's, that's good. The first awesome. time I heard that, I fell off my dinosaur. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> come on. I didn't know you knew. Dude, I didn't know not, you knew. That's not original. I didn't know you I were mean, tight with him. No, not from him. I'm saying this. 70%. If I'm on a fantasy football team, there's about 60% chance that's the name. Well, I think it's cool. Name. Come on, Sanchez. That's really good polling. <laughs> that's immediate polling, Zach. <laughs> it's impressive, yeah. dude. Not that I pay attention. When you guys were down 9-7 to Dallas on Sunday night, where's your head? What are you thinking? Are you yelling at the TV? Are you kind of like pacing? Are you just icing and recovering? <laughs> What's going on? I was game ready and, you know, trying to get the ankle right. But there was definitely some yelling at the screen. Um, <laughs> more so to, to, like, get the guys going, you know. I'd be the guy yeah. getting them going. But, it's I mean, it's tough. It's tough not being able to do anything. You just sit there. Um, it's a weird, weird feeling. Um, you invest so much in the team and the game. And just to not be able to be at the – or, like, be involved in the game and stuff. Did you wear but, eye black uh, on the couch? What did you do? <laughs> I should have. I should have worn my helmet and full game uniform. <laughs> I knew even though we were down 9-7, I knew we were going to win the football game. Yeah. And that's, I mean, no matter how the game's going, this team's always going to fight. The team is always going to give us a chance at the end of the game. Yeah. And so I just knew that the guys were going to keep battling and eventually things were going to turn. And they did. Our defense played out of their freaking minds. Brandon Graham, one of the best DNs in the league for so long. He needs to go to his first Pro Bowl this year. So hopefully fourth and forever podcast can help push Brandon Graham to the Pro Bowl. Let's go. All right. That's our new initiative. You guys heard it here first. Brandon Graham, Pro Bowl 2020. <laughs> how did he not go to the Pro Bowl, the Super Bowl year? He had a great year, not just the big play at the end. He had a good yeah, year. Yeah, he's, I mean, he's had a lot of great years. Just one of those things, the guys he's going against, typically it's all sacks-based. Brandon's yeah, a guy yeah. that's been around. He's had a ton of pressures. He gets a ton of pressures each and every week um, right. and in the past. Which are sometimes, sometimes more important sack than the sack, number. right? Yeah, because you, know, you get the pressure and the guy throws the ball too early, too late, whatever, and that's when you get a lot of these turnovers and big plays by the defense, so... There's an argument yeah. for that. It's just not as sexy as a number, I guess. What about your guys' division? Because everybody's, you know, everybody's freaking out about the NFC East. You know, it's the worst division in football, this, that, and the other. The Cowboys don't have a quarterback. The Giants look awful. Washington doesn't have a team name. Like, you hear it every day <laughs> in sports media. Now that I work in it, I'm like, dang, is it really that bad? Well, I look at your guys' roster, and I'm like, well, hold on now, because Ertz is going to get healthy. Goddard's back. I don't know. Is Alshon out for the year? No, he'll be back. Yeah, he'll be back. Deshaun's going to come back, it sounds like, maybe. Ankle injury yeah. or something like that. That sucked because he kind of got hit late. And yeah. That was shitty. But I don't know. I just feel like you guys are trending in the right direction. Talk about the entire division. Where where do you see you guys at? And does it align with what the media makes of the NFC, NFC East? I mean, obviously, to not be have a team above 500 isn't ideal at this point in the year. 
But at the same time, we're not really focused on what we can't control. We've lost a couple games that we probably felt like we should have won. Um, we tied a game that probably felt like we should have won. Um, and every team in our division has probably had a couple games like that. And we've played two really tough divisions or two out of conference. Divisions are the AFC North and the NFC West, um, two of the tougher divisions in football. And like you said, I mean, we battled a lot of injuries. The Cowboys have battled a lot of injuries, but I'm going to get healthy. I'm going to come back. Lane's going to get healthy. Dallas is starting to trend in the right direction playing last week. JP is getting healthy again. Miles Sanders is going to come back. And so on offense, um, we're definitely going to be trending up uh, at the right time when we need to, but we got a lot of top tough football games coming up. I think we play the Cardinals, the Seahawks, the Saints. Uh, we play the Browns, and I know there's one or two more. So we just got to be able to go out there, and even though our talent is kind of coming together, we got to go out there and win some football games because that's what this league is all about, wins and losses. And we just got to go find find a way to win football games. And once you get in the playoffs, you know how it is. It doesn't matter when you, you play that first playoff game. It doesn't matter what your record is during the season. All you care about is winning that one football game and then having the ability to play one more. And the year we went to the Super Bowl, we were the number one seed. The first game against the Falcons, first time a number one seed was the underdog in the playoff game. And we won that game. And then we just had to win one more at home against the Vikings, won that one, and then won again in the Super Bowl. So all you got to do is get into the playoffs. Once you're there, no one yeah. is asking questions. Just get into the dance and, and see what happens. I think that's, exactly. you know, you guys are trending in the right direction health-wise. And so that's going to be huge for you guys as you go down the stretch against some of those great teams like you talked about. Let's talk about your um, your foundation that you and Julie, uh, I've seen a lot of great stuff on Instagram. And I know you give back to the city of Philadelphia quite a bit. You talked about the fans being crazy about football. And it always seems like Philly, as one of the franchises I played for, they do a great job of getting guys involved in the community with Community Tuesdays. And then more importantly, these guys, a lot of players I've seen there have their own foundations. Guys like Connor Barwin, guys like Malcolm Jenkins. Those are guys that were older than you. Any inspiration from them? Is this kind of, is that, did they have any influence on you in starting this foundation? Or where did the inspiration come from? I know your mom's involved. So just talk about your foundation, any inspiration for it. Two years ago or three years ago now, uh, I went down to Haiti with Carson on a mission trip with his foundation actually. Um, and we stayed at a place called the Mission of Hope. And just being down there for a week, seeing what the mission was doing in Haiti, as a, really impacting the entire country of Haiti and really bringing about substantial change, feeding hundreds of thousands of people each and every day, backed by Christ, was something that when I got back to the States, I called Julie, I said, hey, this is something that I, I think it's time. You know, being in Philadelphia, being around Connor, being around Malk, seeing what those guys were able to do in the communities, I called Julie, I said, hey, let's let's do this thing. Um, we called it the Ertz Family Foundation because it wasn't going to be the Zach Ertz Foundation. It wasn't going to be the Julie Ertz Foundation. We really wanted to do it together and also bring people in and be a part of our family. Um, no matter where they were, we felt like this thing could be something much bigger than the two of us. My mom, who has a long history running foundations, is our executive director. And so since COVID hit, we've really tried to step up in the city of Philadelphia. You know, we've, we've done a lot of stuff on the side for years here, um, but with the foundation, with everything impacted by COVID, um, we, we really wanted to step up the city of Philadelphia, public schools for football, the whole season was canceled. So this fall, we started this program with a lot of amazing other foundations, ODAP, Tim Mateo, um, being able to start something called Beyond the Field, where we're able to actually allow these kids under the CDC guidelines to come out and practice football twice a week, Tuesdays, Thursdays. We'd feed them, bring them out there, and just allow them to get off the streets. You know, I, I was fortunate enough in high school having sports from three to seven, being able to really invest my time in a football and basketball so you don't get in trouble. And so our outlook right. was, well, these kids' seasons have been taken away by COVID, how can we stand in the gap with them to help them be off the streets during this time? And so we stepped in for that in the fall. Uh, we're actually just finishing that, that up and ready to kind of transition to our winter beyond the field. Um, and then also for the three home games in Philadelphia, thanks to an anonymous donor that met, is matching us for every home touchdown we score, there's gonna be 5,000 meals donated to the city of Philadelphia. And when I wow. score, when I get back, ho hopefully a lot, it's gonna be 10,000 meals. Um, so wow. we have two home games remaining. The first home game, we raised 15,000 meals for the city um, and really looking forward to the next two as well. Dude, that is 
incredible, incredible work. <laughs> um, and really cool for the city. Very gracious of you and Julie and, and your mom to use that uh, idea of family and bring people in because, you know, we're living in a world where everything's so divided. And so that's, uh, it's obviously a breath of fresh air for everybody. And uh, I commend you for doing that. That's really cool. You've put together this incredible NFL career to date. Where do you see your career when it's all said and done? How long do you want to play? And what else do you want to accomplish? Obviously, I've been very fortunate uh, to be in the NFL for, this is my eighth year. I've been in Philly for eight years. Played with a great quarterback like yourself who set the record for me <laughs> for completions in a game with 15 um for the eagles so where do i see it going you know i feel like i have a lot of good football in me um i don't feel like i've slowed down i watch the film with a very critical eye and feel like i'm still getting open like i always do um so i feel like i have another good four years of being a really really good player five years of being a really good player but i don't really know man i'm gonna take it year by year and see how the body's feeling at the end of each and every one obviously we've accomplished a lot in this first eight years of my career. And I'm excited what the second half is gonna be. I feel like I'm just now entering the quote unquote, if I was gonna divide my career, this would be the first year of the second half. So I'm excited about it. I feel like I need I need another Super Bowl ring. That's my only goal going forward <laughs> is to find a way to win another Super Bowl. Cause there's no feeling better. You, once you win the, the first one, it's like nothing will compare to that when you're playing football. Right. You know, the year we won the Super Bowl, we had so many guys, and the following year, I set the record for catches by a tight end. I tell people all the time, the Super Bowl year was a thousand times more fun than being nine and seven wow. and setting the record for catches. And so for me, it's all about trying to find ways to win football games and win a Super Bowl. Zach Ertz, we appreciate you. Big hug to you and your family. Keep doing all that awesome stuff on the field. And we're looking forward to getting you back healthy as soon as possible. Thank you again for joining the show. Yes, sir. Finally able to get it done. You knew I would never leave you hanging, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this was a long time in the work, so I do appreciate it. <laughs> it means a lot. Thank you. Like, share, subscribe, uh, at Mark underscore Sanchez, at Fourth and Forever, Instagram, Twitter, all that. You know where to go. Thanks again for having us, and we'll see you soon.